Friends, we are gathered here to listen to The Loved One by Evelyn Wall. And friends, I want you to know that it was adapted for radio by Bill Matthews. Episode 2. Haven't you finished that Great Dane yet, Dennis? It's taking a little longer than I thought. Because I got a muskrat waiting. Quick as I can. Oh, uh, Mr. Schultz, could I possibly have some time off to uh, go to Whispering Glades to arrange Sir Francis' funeral? Arrange a funeral? That's what I pay you to do here. Don't you know there's an outbreak of horse meat poisoning in Pasadena? We're up to here. But, Mr. Schultz, it'll be valuable experience for Experience? Me. I give you experience. Every day more motor cars come off the assembly line onto the roads. Every day more pets go onto the roads and into our icebox. That's all the experience you need to know about. But I'm picking up all kinds of new ideas there. New ideas, huh? Do we get people to pay $5,000 for a pet's funeral? How many pay 500 Not two in a month. Our clients say, Bind him up cheap, Mr. Schultz, just so the city don't have him and make me a shame. If folks pretend to love their pets, talk to them like they was children. Along comes a citizen in his new auto, floods of tears then. Mr. Schultz, is a headstone socially essential? I believe you're jealous of Whispering Glades. Jealous? Why wouldn't I be jealous seeing all that dough spent on relations they've hated all their lives? While the pets who loved them and stood by them, never asked no questions, never complained, gets buried anyhow like they was just animals. Ah, take your time off, Dennis. Only don't expect to be paid for it on account of your thinking up some fancy new ideas. Good morning, Miss Thanatogenes. Good morning, Mr. Joy Boy. Here is the strangulated loved one for the orchid room. Sir Francis Hinsley. Indeed. Was he a very difficult case, Mr. Joy Boy? He was, but I think everything has turned out satisfactorily, if you'd care to look. But, Mr. Joy Boy, you've given him the radiant childhood smile. Yes. Don't you like it? Oh, yes, he's beautiful, but his waiting one did not ask for it. Miss Thanatogenous, for you, the loved ones just naturally smile. Oh, Mr. Joy Boy. It's true. It seems I'm just powerless to prevent it. When I'm working for you, there's something inside me says, he's on his way to Miss Thanatogenous, and my fingers take control. Haven't you noticed it? <laughs> well, Mr. Joy Boy, I did remark it only last week. All the loved ones that come from Mr. Joy Boy lately, I said, have the most beautiful smiles. <laughs> oh, all for you, Miss Thanatogenous. All for you. The happier hunting ground? Bono, a word. Oh, Sir Ambrose, how pleasant to hear from you. Bono, I want you to find something suitable from Sir Francis's works for me to read at his graveside. Something from his own writing that gives us the essence of the man, his love of nature and fair play, that sort of thing. Did Frank love nature or fair play? I don't think he was against them. See, I can't remember seeing any of his works at the house. Find something, Bono, any personal scrap. I tell you what... If you can't think of anything else, write a poem yourself. After all, that is what you do, isn't it? Yes, Sir Ambrose, according to my passport. Everything ready for the funeral, then? Well, I'm going over to Whispering Glades this afternoon. Well, I'll leave it all to you, then, Barlow. Thank you. I have more urgent matters to attend to. The cricket club are debating whether to send a telegram of congratulations to Dennis Compton for his 18 centuries. But there's a rumour flying around that he went to a secondary school. Oh, heaven forfend. Miss Thanatogenous. Mr. Joy Boy. I've finished. Hmm. You've certainly brought the color back to his cheeks. Thank you, Mr. Joy Boy. I can always trust you to carry out my intention. D did you have any difficulty with the right eyelid? Mm, just a little. Hmm. Tendency to open on the inside corner? Yes, but I worked a little cream under the lid and then firmed it with number six. Oh, excellent. I never have to tell you anything. We work as one. When I send a loved one in to you, Miss Thanatogenous, I feel as though I was speaking to you through him. Do you ever feel that yourself? I know I'm always specially careful and proud when it's one of yours, Mr. Joyboy. I believe you are, Miss Thanatogenous. Bless you. Excuse me, Mr. Joyboy. The two loved ones have just arrived. 
What are they? One of them is an infant. Will you be taking her yourself? Yes, as always. Mm. Is it a mother and child? Uh, let me see. No, no relation. Very well. Mr. Vogel can take the adult. Okay, Mr. Joyboy. Had they been mother and child, Miss Thanatogenes, I would have taken them both, busy though I am. There's something in individual technique. Not everyone would notice it, perhaps, but if I saw a pair that had been embalmed by different hands, I should know at once and feel that the child did not properly belong to its mother, as if they'd been estranged in death. Perhaps I seem whimsical. You do love children, don't you, Mr. Joy Boy? Yes, Miss Thanatogenes. There's something in the innocent appeal of a child that brings out the best in me. It's as though I were inspired sometimes from outside or above by something higher and greater than us all. Dear Guru Brahmin, I read your advice column every day in the newspaper, and I hope you can help me with my problem, as you have helped others. I work with a man who is head of the department and in every way the most wonderful character I can imagine. In all sorts of ways, he has made it plain that he prefers me to the other girls, and I admire him greatly. But I do not have, have the, the same, same feelings, feelings when, when I am with, with him, him as the, the girls, girls say, say they, they have when they are with their boys and what one sees in the movies. But will the feelings perhaps come in time, or will it never be? Or am I perhaps in love and I don't know it yet? Yours in hope, Amy Thanatogenos. That girl's got serious problems. Oh, she does sound awful mixed up, Mr. Slump. I'm talking about that name, Amy Thanatogenos. She must have been at the back of the queue when they handed them out, right in front of red buttons, and you thought... <laughs> You should do something about that cough. I will, Rhoda, right away. Where's that bottle? Uh. <clears throat> mm. Ah, see? Instant cure. <laughs> right. Uh, take this down. <clears throat> no, A.T. I do not consider that you are in love yet. Esteem for a man's character and admiration of his business ability may form the basis of an improving friendship, but they are not love. Put love in capitals, please. <clears throat> but remember, love comes late to many. We know cases who have only experienced real love after several years and the arrival of Junior. See plenty of your friend. Love may come. I return your hope. Guru Brahmin. <clears throat> Type that up and throw a dumbass letter at the garbage. <laughs> oh, Mr. Slump. If only you could talk as well as you dictate. Mm -hmm. Get your tickets here for the Lake Island of Innisfree, the most poetic place in Whispering Glades. Get your tickets here for the boat to the island. Uh, one, please. One? You're not meeting anybody then? Nope. Only, I've seen no single Danes here all afternoon. Mostly folks come in couples, see? Though sometimes a guy has a date and the dame don't show up. Better get the dame before you get the ticket, I guess. Listen, I have no dame. I have merely come here to write a poem. I thought this might be a good play. Oh, I wouldn't know, bud. I never wrote a poem. But I hear it's named after a very fancy one. Better come bold. Thank you. Yeah. It certainly is a poetic place to be planted in. Costs around a thousand bucks. The poeticist place in the whole of Whispering Glades. Off we go. It's private, see? You don't get animals, like in most cemeteries, on account of it's surrounded by water. The dreamer joked about that once in the Whispering Blades Annual. Most cemeteries, he says, provide a dog's toilet and a cat's motel. So we don't get no animals, though you wouldn't think it to hear some of the noises coming from behind bushes. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree. And a small cabin built there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. I will arise and go now, and go to Inner's Free. There I will sit down and write some poetry. <clears throat> Bury the great night with the studio's valediction. 
Let us bury the great knight who is the arbiter of popular fiction. Oh, no, it doesn't quite strike the right note. Take two. They told me, Francis Hinsley, they told me you were hung with red protruding eyeballs and a black protruding tongue. I wept as I remembered how often you and I had laughed about Los Angeles, and now it is here you'll lie. Here, pickled in formaldehyde and painted like a whore. Shrimp pink, incorruptible, not lost nor gone before. Uh, not what Sir Ambrose had in mind, I fear. Oh, hello. Oh, pardon me. Aren't you the friend of the strangulated loved one in the orchid room? I am. I'm afraid my memory's very bad for live faces. I didn't expect to find anyone here. Well, have I taken your place? Not really. I mean, it's Mr. Kaiser's place, not mine or yours. Mr. Kaiser's? Off Kaiser's stoneless peaches. This is his family burial plot. His wife and his aunt are here already. You come here often? Mm, after work sometimes. It's usually deserted. I'll go some other place. No, no certainly not. I'll go. I only came here to write a poem, anyway. A poem? Did you say a poem? Uh, yes, you see, I'm a poet. Why, but I think that's wonderful. Oh, I've never seen a live poet before, only dead ones. Did you know Sophie Dalmayer Crump? No, I can't say I did. She's in Poet's Corner now. She had very marked soul. You might even say I learned soul from studying Sophie Dalmayer Crump. Now, whenever we have a treatment needing special soul... Mr. Joyboy gives it to me. Would you have me if I passed on? Mm, you'd be difficult. You're the wrong age for soul. It seems to come more naturally in the very young or the very old, but I'd certainly do my best, especially considering you're a poet. But you have a very poetic occupation here. <sighs> yes, I know. Only sometimes at the end of a day when I'm tired, I feel as if it were all rather ephemeral. I mean, you and Sophie Delmayer Crump write a poem, and maybe they'll still be reading it in hundreds of years' time. Whereas my work is burned inside a few hours or put unseen into the mausoleum where it deteriorates. Do you think anything can be great art that is so impermanent? Yeah, of, of course, for it lives on in the minds of those who've seen it. As the face of Sir Francis Hinsley I saw this afternoon will certainly live on in mine. Thank you. Listen, I'd be awfully interested if you'd tell me about yourself and your work. Would you? Well, I've always been artistic. I took art as my second subject in college one semester. I'd have taken it as first subject, only Dad lost his money in religion, so I had to learn a trade. He lost his money in religion? Yes, the four-square gospel. That's why I'm called Amy. After Amy Semple McPherson, you know, the evangelist. Only she disappeared for a week and came back with her clothes all disheveled, so Dad lost his investment. And his religion, no doubt, But the name kind of stuck. Mother kept forgetting what we changed it to, and then she'd find the new one. Once you start changing a name, you see, there's no reason ever to stop. You always hear one that sounds better. Hmm. What was your main subject in college? Beauty crap. Oh. Everything you get in a beauty parlor. Permanence, facials, wax, you know. I'm afraid not. It wasn't studied at my university. Pity. Have you worked here long? Nearly two years, but it's only in the last year that I've come to love the work. When Mr. Joyboy arrived, the whole tone of the mortuary became greatly elevated. On his first day, Mr. Joyboy said to one of the morticians, Mr. Parks, I must ask you to remember you are not at the happier hunting ground. The happier hunting ground? I don't suppose you'd have heard of it. No, I don't believe I have. It's a dreadful place where they bury animals. That's not poetic. They try and do everything the same as us. It seems kind of blasphemous. Hmm. So, what do you think about when you come here alone in the evenings? Oh, just death and art. Half in love with easeful death. What was that you said? Oh, I was quoting a poem. For many a time I have been half in love with easeful death. Called him soft names and many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Did you write that? Um, you like it? Why, it's beautiful. 
It's just what I've thought so often and haven't been able to say. To make it rich, to die. To cease upon the midnight with no pain. That's exactly what Whispering Glades is for, isn't it? I suppose so. Oh, I think it's wonderful to be able to write like that. Did you write it when you came here? Oh, it was uh, written long before. Well, I guess it's time for me to go. And I have a poem to finish. Will you stay and do it here? No, at home. I'll come with you. I'd love to see the poem when you finished it. I'll send it to you. Amy Thanatogenes is my name. I live quite close, but send it here to Whispering Glades. This is my true home. If only Sir Francis could have lived to see this turn out, Barlow. You would certainly have wondered what we're all doing here. You're right. Fine, fine turnout. All the Megalo people, half of Paramount, a quarter of Warners, and one from RKO hidden behind the pillar. That chap up front looks just like Spencer Tracy. That's not surprising. You mean it is? No, it's his stand-in double. He's hoping people will think he's the actor, of course. I hear it's his life's ambition to be mobbed by a bunch of screaming fans. Well, there's not much chance of that looking like Spencer Tracy. There's a full assembly present. Of doubles? Certainly. Mr. Baumbine of Megalo Studios arranged it. There's Gary Cooper's next to Errol Flynn's. The one slumped half out of the aisle. Yes. Takes his job a bit too seriously. Who's that one? Doing the second-rate impression of Charles Lawton. That is Charles Lawton. Oh, yes, so it is. By the way, Barlow, such a pity you couldn't write me a poem for the occasion. Reciting his unsigned review of Siegfried Sassoon's The Old Huntsman for the Times Literary Supplement of 1917 wasn't quite what I was thinking of. That goat's been in the oven for nearly an hour now, Mr. Schultz. Ah, just use the poker to break it up a little. Ay, 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 I tell you, Dennis, it's shameful. We'd cremated six dogs, two cats... A chicken called Roger. ...and a Barbary goat this afternoon. And how many owners are here to pay their last respects? None. And only Roger gets his own urn. <sighs> well, I'm going along now. Uh, will you wait until they're cold enough to pack up? Uh, put aside the chicken for the columbarium, uh, and the others are for home delivery. OK, Mr. Schultz. Oh, what about the goat's card? Huh? We, well, we can't very well say he's wagging his tail in heaven. Goats don't wag their tails. They do when they go to the bathroom. Yes, but it wouldn't look right on the greeting card. They don't purr like cats. They don't sing an orison like birds. I suppose they just remember. Hmm. Your Billy is remembering you in heaven tonight. Thanks, Mr. Schultz. See you tomorrow. Dennis. Dennis. What? Oh, hello, Amy. You were in the dream world. <laughs> I was, Amy. The dream world where poetry resides. I wish I could go there, too. Thank you for that last poem you sent me. I think it's one of your most beautiful. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. I know it by heart. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest thou, and slip into my bosom and be lost in me. It almost seems like you wanted me to do something unethical, yet in an ethical way, if that were possible. Oh, I assure you it is. Not like that other poem you wrote me, to his coy mistress. I don't see what's unethical. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. Worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust. And into ashes all my lust. My mother would kill me if she heard me say such things. That is, if she wasn't out of east or dead. No, all I meant was... Let's not argue about it, Dennis. I mean, you can't write a good poem every day. No, no. Uh, listen, I've brought you another one I finished this morning. I hope you like it. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day... Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease have all too short a date. 
Oh, it's so beautiful. Funny, though, it reminds me of something I once learned at school. Really? I can't think what it could be. Uh, no, no, neither can I. That's not to say you haven't got a unique style all of your own, Dennis. Haven't you ever thought about getting these poems published? Well, I somehow feel that other people wouldn't appreciate them in quite the same way you do. Dear Guru Brahmin, I am writing to your newspaper again for advice. You remember I told you about a man I work with whom I admire but do not love, but who loves me? Now I have met another, but he is not at all such an admirable character. He is British, and therefore in many ways quite un-American. I do not mean just his accent and the way he eats, but he is cynical about things which should be sacred. He has no idea of citizenship or social conscience. So what hope is there of true happiness? I should value your advice very highly. Cordially yours, Amy Thanatogenes. Miss Thanatogenes, I'm anxious to have a word with you. What is it, Mr. Joyboy? Miss Thanatogenes, I want you to know how much I appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Joyboy. I mentioned it yesterday to the dreamer. Oh, thank you, Mr. Joyboy. For some time, the dreamer has been looking forward. He always looks forward, Miss Thanatogenes. He considers that the time has come for women to take their rightful place in whispering glades. They've proved themselves in the lowlier tasks to be worthy of the higher. Miss Thanatogenes, the dreamer, intends to train a female embalmer, and his choice... His very wise choice has fallen on you. Oh, Mr. Joyboy. Say nothing. I know how you feel. May I tell him you accept? Oh, Mr. Joyboy. I'll take that as a yes. It will be my pleasure to acquaint you with the embalming rooms. Oh, Mr. Joyboy. And uh, if I may intrude a personal note, I think this calls for a little celebration. Would you do me the honor of taking supper with me at my home this evening? I don't know what to say. I sort of made a date. But that was before you heard the news. Besides, Miss Thanatogenes, it was not my intention we should be alone. I claim as my right the very great privilege and pleasure of presenting the First Lady Embalmer of Whispering Glades to my mom. I'll pick you up at seven. Oh, Mr. Joyboy. Am I late? Yes, but I don't mind. Dennis, I'm going to have to break our date tonight. Mr. Joyboy has asked me to supper with his mom. Oh, two Joyboys at one sitting. That should be fun. I suppose they live up the posh end. Uh, not quite Beverly Hills, but hasn't given up trying. You don't mind? It's just that he wants to celebrate because I'm to be offered a job as an embalmer. I say, that is something. How much is it worth? I didn't go into the question of money. Would well, you suppose it's a hundred a week? Oh, I don't suppose anyone except Mr. Joyboy gets that. Oh, Fifty, anyway. Fifty will do. For what? Well, to live on, you and me. What did you say? Well, we can get married, don't you see? It won't be less than fifty, will it? But you haven't asked me to marry you. And what makes you think I want to marry you anyway? Well, it's only the money that can hold us back. Now we'll have enough for two. For two? An American would despise himself for living off his wife. Ah, but you see, I'm European. I think you're entirely contemptible. <laughs> I say, you're not really in a rage, are you? Amy? Amy? Mr. Swamp, here's a telegram for you. Uh, uh, Guru Brahmin, stop. Don't bother to answer letter of mourning. Stop. Know my mind now. Stop. Amy Thanatogenes. <clears throat> Thanks, Rhoda. <clears throat> this is your house? Yep. All paid for. This is just a little place I got in a hurry to settle Mom when we came west. Oh, I see. I never seem to get around to doing anything about the garden. <laughs> Come on in. You, Mom, we're here. Quiet. And you remember how we saw the Mom, 
Well, this? We can Sit down quietly till this I is say, over. Invade Russia now before it's too late. The old lady before hates to miss the political commentary. I said quietly. You want to overrun the garden that is America is now. Pull them out and burn them. And while you're doing that, remember to use spongy toilet tissue for extra soft results. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, Mom? I wouldn't use spongy toilet tissue on a cat. Um, Mom, this is Amy Thanatogenes. Mm, very well. Suffer's in the kitchen. Get it when you like. Are you hungry, Amy? No. Uh, yes. Well, I suppose a little. Well, let's go see what surprise the little old lady's been cooking up for us. Surprise? It's what you always get. I ain't got the time for surprises. Hey, Sammy, Sammy. Sammy, won't you speak to me? Why, Mom, you know that parrot hasn't spoken in years. He speaks plenty while you're away, don't you, my Sammy? Uh. See? Well, if I didn't have Sammy to love me, I might as well be dead for all the love I get. Ain't that right, Sammy? <laughs> this ain't how we're used to living, nor where we're used to living. We come from the east, and if anybody had listened to me, that's where we'd be now. We had a color girl in Vermont, came in regular. Fifteen bucks a week, and glad of it. You can't find no color girls here. Mom, I'm sure Amy... I'm sure Amy. Look at that lettuce. There's more things than cheaper things, and I'm telling you better things where we come from. And even if I did find something worth buying, I couldn't afford to buy it. Huh. Mom loves a joke. Joke? Call it a joke to keep house on what I get and visitors coming in. Look what you got there. Tin soup, tin crab. I'd be forced to buy tin salad if they sold it. Oh, please, Mom. And in Vermont, the girls work. Amy works very hard, Mom. I told you. Nice work, too. I wouldn't let my daughter do it if I had a daughter, which I don't. Where's your mother, child? Um, she went east. I think she died. Better dead in the east than alive in the west. You think she died, eh? That's all children care nowadays. Now, Mom, you've no call to say things like that. You know I care. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it's about time for me to go now. Thank you, Mrs. Joy Boy. For what? Um, I'll see you out. I drive you home, only I don't like to leave Mom. Uh, the streetcar passes the corner. You'll be all right. Yes, I'll be all right. Mom just loved you. Did she? Why, yes. I always know. When Mom takes a fancy to people, she treats them natural, same as she treats me. She certainly treated me natural. I'll say she did. You made a great impression. Well, goodbye, Amy, if I may call you Amy. Goodbye, Mr. Joy Boy. Dear Guru Brahman, please ignore the telegram which asked you to ignore the letter which asked you to... Friends, you've been listening to The Loved One by Evelyn Wall. Adapted for radio by Bill Matthews. I truly want our heartfelt thanks to go out to many, many people, including Miranda Richardson, who appeared as Amy Thanatogenes, Rupert Graves as Dennis Barlow, Donald Pickering as Sir Ambrose Abercrombie, Richard Griffiths as Mr. Joy Boy, Mike McShane as Mr. Slump, Graham Hoadley as Mr. Schultz, Elaine Eyes Cameron as Mrs. Joy Boy, Sue Broomfield as Rhoda, and Simon Trees as the Boatman. The Loved One was produced by Lissa Evans. Amen.